Hello there, listening audience, and welcome to another week of Unlock the Door Radio, where we like to look into issues in a deep manner and challenge everyone out there to be thinking about what's going on in the world today. And tonight, we are fortunate to have a very, very interesting guest, and his name is Joseph Tainter, and he's the author of The the Collapse of Complex Societies. And what I think is going to be really interesting is that it seems that there's a lot of popularity now with programs ranging from you know, The Walking Dead to Hunger Games and a variety of dystopian societal breakdown themes. And so it's something people are thinking about out there, and it'd be kind of interesting to see exactly what would happen if – we were hit with something that would cause a societal breakdown. Um, well, welcome, uh, Mr. Tanter. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we should just start off with you um, introducing, you know, I know you're an anthropologist and historian, but you've written a book called The Collapse of Complex Societies. What's that about, in brief? Well, I began my career as, as an archaeologist, an archaeologist and historian. And one of the major questions of history has always been why did ancient civilizations from time to time seem to collapse? Classic examples being the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, the collapse of the lowland Maya. And the question that's often unstated but I think is in everyone's mind is uh, are we also vulnerable to this? Is it something that only happened to ancient societies? So I looked at a number of case studies and and fairly thoroughly reviewed the literature on on why ancient societies collapsed. And the conclusion I came to is that as these societies evolved, you would see them growing more and more complex to solve problems. And complexity always has a cost. It has an energy cost. So as these societies would grow more complex, they'd also grow more costly until finally they would reach a point of diminishing returns where they simply couldn't afford any longer to solve their problems or to support the level of complexity that they had. And this is when they would become increasingly vulnerable to collapse. You see this, for example, in in the Roman Empire late in its history um, in response to to crises in the 3rd century AD. The empire and its army grew larger and more complex, and they succeeded for a time in sustaining themselves. But this imposed very high support very high cost on the peasant population in the form of taxes. Uh, And of course, peasant subsistence agriculture is not very productive to begin with. And ultimately, the empire exceeded the point where, or or reached the point where it had lost its resiliency uh, because of this previous exercise in in trying to sustain itself. And so it simply became increasingly vulnerable to collapse and and was finally finally ended in, in during the course of the 5th century AD. And this seems to be uh, an example of how complex societies evolve. They become more and more complex over time, uh, requiring higher and higher levels of energy to to maintain themselves and become increasingly vulnerable to what we might call perturbations or to challenges. Um, And and this is the, the lesson, I think, for our societies today. We have the most complex societies that have existed in human history. And at the same time, we consume amounts of energy that uh, ancient people could never have dreamed of. And and the two are connected. Uh, Consuming these large amounts of energy, primarily through fossil fuels, is what allows us to be the complex society that we are. Energy ultimately drives everything. So there's always been a question then, are, are, are our societies today, our complex societies of today, vulnerable to collapse from disruption of energy sources or disruption of other kinds of resources. Okay, the, so you're saying that, for instance, in, in the old days when, for instance, the car, the Model T came out, one of the advantages to it was anyone with any kind of mechanical skill could pretty much fix it if something went wrong with it. Whereas, right. whereas today our modern cars have complex electronical systems, computer systems built in, and essentially you really need, even if you have knowledge, you would have to have the, you would have to have the tools, the 
computer systems in order to actually diagnose and fix a car nowadays. So, is that well, precisely, and, that, and that's really an excellent example. Um, you know, t cars today are essentially mobile computers, and it's become harder and harder for backyard mechanics. I used to be one myself when I was younger, but it's become harder and harder for backyard mechanics to even work on their own cars anymore um, because it, it takes a, a fairly complex system, much more so than in the past, to maintain them. Okay, and in our society today, I mean, we can't get by without computers. I mean, they're built into every single thing and, and so forth. Yes, yes. And I've, yes, indeed. I've heard in the 1870s there was a, a solar flare, solar storm that knocked out telegraphs around the world, and if something similar to that happened, it would, it would really wreak havoc on our electrical grid. Yes, well, there... There has been a study that, that the U.S. Congress commissioned, I think back in 2008, on the effect of an electromagnetic pulse um, if there were a nuclear detonation in space um, with a device designed to produce a, an electromagnetic pulse that would cover all of North America. Um, it would essentially wipe out all of our electronics and that would clearly bring about a collapse in our way of life. And the commission uh, that studied this concluded that within a year, something like two-thirds of, of the population of the United States would be dead, something like 200 million people. I actually think it would happen faster than that. I think it would happen within three to four months. Um, but that would certainly precipitate a collapse. Okay, yeah, because, I mean, we can see, like, if someone has a pacemaker <laughs> or something, but... I mean, essentially, if I were to ask, for instance, you know, how sensitive is our society to – well, you did a good segment of the History Channel's documentary after Armageddon. How sensitive are we to that sort of thing? I mean, what would happen? I mean, you're saying that maybe 200 million people in the United States would die if we just lost our computers. What would be the problem? Well, it's not, it's, it's not just computers. We would lose everything. Um, we would lose all electronics. That's the point. And that would mean that there'd be no more transportation, there'd be no more production of fossil fuels, um, there'd be no more communication. And, and particularly the loss of fossil fuels and the loss of transportation would mean that food would no longer be delivered to the cities. And, and I think this is the main source of, of where the deaths would come from. Okay, so for those people that might be out there saying, well, well, you know, I'll build a campfire or something like that. It goes beyond that. There'd be no food. Uh, medical services wouldn't exist. Um, you couldn't get money because the bank, the day and night tellers would be dead. I mean, there's nothing you can right. do there. And then, if the farmers, I mean, the farmers would have no incentive to plant, and if they planted, people would probably ravage it. Yes. In order to survive. <laughs> it sounds again. It sounds yes. Like, okay. Go ahead. No, no. That, that I think that I think that's all correct. That 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 once you lose fossil fuels, computers, uh, communications, and finance, which are I think are really the four cornerstones of our way of life, once you start to lose those, and the fir the first loss would be fossil fuels, then the dominoes start to fall. Um, our our way of life just gradually falls away, and we'd be in a situation where um, people in the cities, in particular, would not have access to food. Uh, within three or four days, most cities would be in chaos with rioting and, and, and people preying upon each other. Uh, the supermarkets would be stripped bare, and there'd be no way to replenish supplies, and people would start to die. Okay. Hey, have you ever watched the TV series Walking Dead? I haven't. Okay, well, it kind of presents this sort of thing, except it's a zombie theme. It's, it's pretty popular right now, but... In it, they deal with a lot of sociological issues, like uh, what kinds of – what would be the reactions of people? I mean that's the basic premise. What, how would society exist? And I mean you know that some people think, well, everyone would pull together and help each other, whereas some people believe we would have like a Hobbesian nightmare take place where everyone would be – again, you know, you found out your neighbor had food. You would go raid your neighbor's house, kill your neighbor. Uh, you know that people's people would have to be defending themselves. What do you think actually would be the likely scenario? Let's say tomorrow, big solar flare, 
or terrorist organization knocks out all of our elect uh, electronics with the EMP pulse. Um, could you do kind of a breakdown of what it would look like, you think, uh, within a month, for instance, of such a breakdown? Well, I think, I think it's portrayed well in After Armageddon that there would be different reactions in different places. Uh, the major crises would be within cities where you would have gangs of predators forming um, who would essentially try to grab all of the resources for themselves and prey upon the population. Uh, and most people, if they have survived and have any fuel left, they would have to try to get out of the cities. In the countryside, what you'd find is that in, in, in rural areas and small towns is that communities would band together and try to survive as communities, um, groups of people with different skills, and, and, and initially, at least, they would try to keep uh, people from cities out and people from cities would be trying to get into these communities so there would be a real source of conflict there okay do you think the military would be able to keep order or would they just figure they have family they need to go home and protect well the, the military would no lo would no more be able to travel than anyone else you know, once once the supplies of liquid fuels are gone um, then the military is as immobilized as everyone else is Okay, so you might have them being the ones who are out there raiding. Then um, uh, that's 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 entirely possible because they have the weapons. Okay, and it's it's happened in other societies where breakdowns have happened, hasn't it? That the military suddenly becomes the warlords instead of the loyal supporters of the government. Well, you can you can look at France during the Hundred Years' War in in primarily in the 14th century, where during periods of peace. There were all of these unemployed knights and foot soldiers who banded together and essentially preyed on the local population. And, and, and the 14th century was a terrible time for France in part because of this. Uh, and, and this is what would happen is, is that um, groups of soldiers, those, those with armed soldiers, groups of police, uh, would band together. Some of them might try to impose a sense of order, but they would also place themselves as leaders of communities and essentially do as they wish. Okay. We're talking about a societal breakdown. Uh, since, you're, since we're dealing with history, I want to go back to modern times here soon. But I've read that actually, for instance, during the bubonic – I mean during the bubonic plague, which you know wiped out like more than half of Europe, that people lost their faith in – traditional social structure. They lost their faith in the feudal structure, in the church, in society in general. And that that stayed around, but it also gave innovation. It meant that afterwards people did, you know, pull up their bootstraps or whatever and they went about rebuilding society, but it was changed. Um, at a big Armageddon type event, you feel that this would have the same effect? Would it would these small communities that band together, would they essentially rewrite everything? I mean, once the government doesn't exist in various societies, they just – you'd have like tribes all over that would, would develop, and you'd see kind of an end to the modern nation state? Oh, oh the nation state would definitely cease to exist, um, and, and, and it, it would be remembered as uh, – in later years as – kind of a, a myth of a lost golden age. But basically, organization would revert to the lowest level that could be supported by local resources. There would be some trade between communities, but trade would be very minimal because of the lack of transportation. Uh, there might be some trade uh, along rivers in places that have major waterways. Uh, but for the most part, people would have to produce their own resources locally and survive locally, and that would be the basis of community organization. Uh, as far as beliefs, in, in the Middle Ages, in response to the troubles and, and the bubonic plagues, there were a variety of, of responses. There were there were people who engaged in rather bizarre religious practices. Um, I think they were simply so psychologically stressed that, that this was a, an outlet for them. Um, other other people uh, took advantage of the situation. There there are always winners and losers during catastrophes. Uh, things like industry and agriculture declined because of a lack of workers. But if you were one of the workers and you survived the bubonic plague, 
you are in a position to demand higher wages, and wages for ordinary workers, in fact, went up. Uh, as far as faith in the feudal system goes, I don't think anyone had faith in the feudal system. It just was. Uh, it was the way of life, and, and, and it was impossible to escape from it. Um, although, of course, the church did support the feudal system. But in part, the feudal system began to break down uh, as a result of the, of the bubonic plague, again, because workers gained power um, by virtue of there being fewer of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I heard that is what really got the industrial, the, the innovations for the industrial age to start is because you need to figure out new ways to do things without as many workers available. Yes. Um, well, industrialization really, I mean, yes, certainly that was the case to some extent, but for industrialization, you really look to the late 18th century with, um, with, with the perfection, with Watt's perfection of the steam engine and, and the source of power that really made industrialization on a large scale possible. Okay. Hey, now, um, now, switching away from the EMP or the solar flare, uh, if it wasn't for that, if it was it wasn't for that uh what do you do you think this everything we're hearing now about ebola or some sort of mutant strain of the flu do you think that this could have the same effect if even if the flu or again ebola was powerful enough to inflict the same percentage of casualties that is in 1918 the spanish flu epidemic would this still have that same effect you're talking about, that you would have many people die just because the infrastructure would fall apart? No, I don't think so. I'm not aware that infrastructure fell apart in 1919, and, and you have to remember that in the United States, right after that pandemic, we had the Roaring Twenties, which is a time of prosperity and economic growth. Um, something like a, a pandemic on the, on the scale of 1918 to 1919 I, I don't see that causing a collapse. And if you look back in history at plagues we know of from ancient times, um, there was a plague in Athens in the late 5th century BC. Uh, there was a plague in the Roman Empire in the mid 2nd century AD, another plague, the first instance of bubonic plague in the 6th century AD, and then of course uh, the great bubonic plague of the Middle Ages. These caused enormous loss of life, uh, far in excess of the 1918 pandemic. Uh, in, in these ancient and medieval plagues, uh, up to a third or as much as 40% of the population would die, and in some places every, almost everyone died. And, and yet there was no collapse in these places. Um, the society changed, but to a large extent, it did not greatly simplify. And, and that's what I consider a collapse to be, is a rapid simplification. A society did not Ages. Recovery was fairly rapid over the next few decades. So I, d I don't see something like the 1918 pandemic causing a collapse. It might cause a mild recession, and, and I think that would be all. Okay, so what do you think could create, aside from the electrical impulse, perhaps a, nu a limited nuclear war or something could, could bring about this sort of after Armageddon sort of scenario? Yes, I, th I think a, a nuclear war could definitely cause a collapse. Um, and, and beyond that, if we want to talk about pandemics, we would, ha we would have to be looking at a pandemic that is so horrendous that people are afraid to go to their jobs. And if large numbers of people are afraid to go to critical jobs, infrastructure jobs, transportation, transporting fuel, and so forth, then you get the potential for a breakdown. Um, but it would have to be something truly, truly horrendous. Okay, like it would have to be like a mutant form of Ebola we have not seen yet that would scare people. Yeah, if, if, if Ebola were to become aerosolized, I've, I've seen a, 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 a projection recently that, that by early next year there may be 500,000 Ebola cases in West Africa. Now, of course, these wouldn't be 500,000 at once. It would be a cumulative total, but... If it gets up to that level, there's a good chance that Ebola is going to escape from West Africa. Now, in, in the, the wealthier countries where we have assistance of public health, uh, for the most part, we could, we could contain that. I don't think that that would be a problem unless it became aerosolized. 
and if it becomes transmissible through air, through sneezing and so forth, then people will truly start to become fearful. Now, I'm not suggesting that that in itself would cause a collapse, but something, a disease that is truly, that truly makes people afraid and that's easily contagious could keep people from going to critical infrastructure jobs and that and that could begin to, to create a breakdown. Okay, I just want to go back real quick here because I, I kind of missed one thing here. When I meant a nuclear war, I meant a limited situation where maybe kind of like the Pearl Harbor attack was not a full-scale attack by Japan. It was just aimed at one spot, and it was sort of designed not to start a war, but kind of to, you know, the Japanese wanted to say, hey, we, you know, we've been insulted. You better start selling us stuff we want again, and of course, they got the opposite result. They got a full-scale war, but if something happened where maybe a couple large cities like New York or Los Angeles and couple other London or one of those kind of cities that could create a psychological panic don't you think that w it wouldn't mean that you have a radiation cloud that would send us into a nuclear winter but we could actually have a situation in which uh, people became fearful on, on edge and could create some sort of panic in the streets if if there was a threat to other cities or say a threat to all large cities um, yes, people would try to evacuate, and that would create jams on the roads, um, panic, um, and, and, and just generally a very bad situation. Uh, the long-term consequences of that, I think, would depend on the severity of the crisis and how long the crisis lasts. If there are diplomatic efforts to end the crisis and it ends after a few weeks, people would, of course, go back to the cities that hadn't been bombed and, and pretty much try to pick up their lives. You know, we, we have to remember, looking back at um, Germany and Japan after World War II, their cities had been just devastated, and, and yet they were able to rebuild within a, within a couple of decades, and, and by the 1960s, by the late 1960s, they had caught up economically to, uh, to where they would have been if World War II had happened. So it, it's, possible, it's possible for recovery to happen fairly quickly, but it depends on the key industries. Um, again, uh, I'll mention them, the, the ones that we're so dependent on today, uh, fossil fuels, computers, communications, and finance. All of these have to function to keep our society going, and if they don't function, then things come to a halt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, just a uh you know, getting into this idea of last when when 2012 took place. I mean, there was all kinds of all kinds of speculation about the Mayan prophecies and stuff. And of course, the Mayans were like, "Hey, you know, that's not what the prophecy was all about. It was just there'd be change. It had nothing to do with destruction." Uh, but but still, there was a huge like National Geographic and all. So they were they had all these specials about preppers. What's your opinion of people who decide to go the prepper route? Oh, they're just part of the range of human variation. Um, I, I, I find them interesting, but generally these are people who think that if they build themselves a fort in the woods and stockpile guns, they can survive Armageddon. Uh, and, and in fact, that's not how you survive. You survive by being a member of a community. And this is why people, for example, fleeing cities would really want to get into communities and become part of rural communities. And, and the people in those rural communities might not want to let them in, so there would be conflict there. Uh, but but um, you know, survivalists and doomsday preppers, they, they really don't understand how one survives a catastrophe. On a related note, but not totally different, what's your, do you think people could take a lesson, for instance, from Mormons who stockpile food, uh, and supplies in case of emergency, but they also encourage people within networks to exist. They're not saying, "Oh, go go out in the middle of the woods and just dig a hole and you know tough it out." But they're saying, "Well, what if something bad happens? We have this community that we can continue functioning." So it seems like they would be in a good position. 
Well, I, I live in Utah, of course. I'm, I'm not a member of the Mormon Church, but observing them, I, I am impressed by their capacity for community organization. And having that capacity uh, is, would certainly be an asset in a situation where um, where survival depends on people being interconnected and interdependent. You know, at the same time, um, Utah has the Wasatch Front megalopolis, the main city being Salt Lake City, and I expect that that area would have to be abandoned just uh, just like uh, cities and other places would have to be. Uh, but but I, I think you're right to point out um, with, with with Mormons, it's not it's not just storing food. Storing food gets you through for a while, but long term survival depends on community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. My my father lived through the Depression, and mm -hmm. he commented that at least out in the countryside people did have food. I mean, he told me about the stories where he'd have to, the kids all had to go out and catch grasshoppers and stuff to feed the chickens because mm -hmm. they, they couldn't afford to buy the food for the chickens. But that kept them supplied with a lot of protein and the eggs and, you know, the chickens and so forth. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I think people were more resilient in the Depression era and they would have to learn maybe you know, maybe it's good to learn some gardening skills now, or, or, because I can, and some other skills maybe. I mean, it it seems like after some sort of collapse, it's better to know carpentry than it is to be able to, you know, know how to write poetry or something. Certainly, practical knowledge would be at a premium, and particularly, particularly knowledge involving. 19th century technology and access to 19th century technology, mm -hmm. particularly uh, farming technology. But I think things like horses and oxen would be at a premium, and it would be some time before enough of them could be bred to to reintroduce large-scale farming in this country. Yeah. Well, I hate to say, <laughs> this is going to get some women mad out there, but I've been to rural China, and if, uh -huh. if you can't afford an ox, it's the wife's job. Yeah, she. They, oh, yeah. they actually put a. I seriously, it's true. They put a strap on the wife, and she, and she walks while he plows the the blade into the soil, and so yeah, that, I've seen it many times. So yeah, I guess they, yeah, I, I, they, they do that in India and and and, and parts of Africa also. Yeah, yeah. If if you can't if you can't cultivate with uh, with draft animals, then then you have to cultivate with people. Uh, the, the thing is, with draft animals, you can cultivate a lot more. Yeah. Um, you can you can really inc increase your scale of production. Okay. For the last couple minutes here, because we're running out of time, I was just wondering. Now, your book, Collapse of Complex Societies. Could you just give me like a a couple minute overview of it and kind of make a plug for it? Because I think there's a lot of people out there that would be interested in in this in more detail and the historical and and contemporary. Uh, information that it would contain. Well, I, I I undertook the study because I had been dissatisfied with um, the existing explanations in, in the literature on why ancient societies collapsed, and I looked at it from the economics and 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 asked what what is it about complex societies that makes them vulnerable? And and the answer is that they are complex. And when they grow in complexity, they have to consume more and more energy. Now, we don't realize that today because to us, energy seems to be free. We acquire energy through fossil fuels. All we have to do is stick a straw in the ground and, and, and we have vast amounts of energy. In the past, people were constrained by solar energy. And so when their societies grew more complex, they reached a point where the, the energy basis was simply not sufficient to support it, and they become vulnerable to collapse. But the same principles apply today still, that we need energy to support our level of complexity, and we need energy and resources to solve the problems that we face. Uh, there's a tendency today to think that, that all we need for a sustainable future is for everyone to consume less. Well, it's, it's not that simple. Um, we face a lot of problems, and we're going to face more problems in the future, and it's going to take resources to solve them. And like ancient societies, we have to be able to develop the energy and other resources that we're going to need to solve problems as our societies continue to grow more complex. Now, hopefully, 
in the near future, we're going to be focusing on energy sources that are clean and renewable uh, rather than the energy sources that we rely on so much today. Uh, and, and I think I'm beginning to see you know, that ship just starting to turn a little bit um, with, with uh, renewable energy development in places like, like Germany, where it's been extensively developed, and China is showing a lot of interest in it. And, and it's beginning to happen in the United States as well. So, so what I've argued in, in the Collapse book is that the factors that made ancient societies vulnerable to collapse operate today just as they did in the past. And we can learn lessons from these societies and, and try to apply those lessons to understanding how our own societies should develop in the future. Okay, that sounds really interesting. Just, you know, both historically, economically, as well as just having a knowledge of how infrastructure works. It's really quite interesting. Well, anyway, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, for uh, coming on and sharing this information with the audience. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Okay, well, thank you, and okay. I hope everyone enjoyed that, and hope you return next week for another episode of Unlock the Door Radio right here on UCY-TV uh, Productions. Thank you. <laughs>